So this talk, uh, it's essentially a kind of workshop. So I hope that we can try and make it interactive. Uh, I hope if I ask you some questions, you'll be happy to type your answers. Uh, are you okay to do that? Yes, you're happy to type some answers. Okay, you're telling me what time it is in your country. It's great. Okay, Hussein, Maria Jesus. Good. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, just to begin with, um, Dizzy, I'm trying to change the slide, and the slide isn't quite changing just yet. Let me try again. Okay, here we go. Okay, I've just got a bit of like, okay, great. Uh, there are some contact details, direct contact details for me. So if after the talk you have any questions or any comments, there are some ways you can get hold of me. Um, but you will get a copy of this as a follow up. Okay. Some issue with the volume. Can you hear me okay now? Okay, a few of you are saying you have a problem with the sound, but anyway, most saying it's okay, so I'll press on. So this talk, let's start uh, looking at the talk in general. This is essentially three things, three interconnected things. Uh, one, we will take a look at different kinds of, e of extended speaking activities. We'll think about what is an extended speaking activity, and we'll think about why we do them. Then we will have a look at the importance of planning before you speak. And by this, I don't mean our lesson planning. I mean allowing our students to spend a little bit of time planning what they want to say before they say it. OK, and this will be connected with looking at some ELT research, including some research of mine which uh, looks at the usefulness, the importance, and the benefits of planning. So it's essentially three things that are interconnected. Um, okay, and for those of you who are involved in research, or maybe might be involved in research, I hope it's interesting for you. And those of you who aren't, I hope it gives you a good idea of the kind of academic research that's behind the um, methodology and the ideas that you use in the books. OK, so let's move on. What is extended speaking? Well, that's a good question. I had a Google around uh, and. Um, whoops, sorry, there's I've got a bit of lag on my slides. Do bear with me. OK, I had a Google around and uh, looking i asked the question what is extended speaking uh and this is something i found online it's a type of speaking activity that involves learners speaking for longer periods of time and in a freer form than controlled speaking practice now that's pretty vague i've been in observing classes in classrooms in certain countries where if the student says a sentence that is good so that in effect is extended speaking I've also observed classes and been in other classrooms where the students have spoken for 10, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So what is extended speaking? It depends on your context. I think it's anything more than controlled speaking practice where, let's say, you have to make a sentence using a certain grammatical structure or a sentence using some certain vocabulary item. It's where you have a bit more freedom to speak uh, about what you want and say what you want. So whether it's just a few seconds or whether it's 10, 20 minutes, that's the key thing. It's a freer form um, than if it's controlled. OK, so. It's free speaking without fear, Allah. Yes, hopefully. OK. Um, what kind of extended speaking tasks are there? So this is the first question I'd like to um, ask you. Can you just put in the chat box what different kinds of expended, extended speaking tasks can we use in the classroom? Any ideas? Would you like to type some suggestions? Different kinds of speaking activities. Debates, good. Role plays, interviews, dialogues, role plays, presentations, good. Talk for a minute about a topic. Paki, yes. 
presenting the answers. Okay, sometimes giving the answers to exercises, etc. Monologues, talk about monologues, reformulation, view of something, plays again, discussions, debates, story cubes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Lots of nice ideas there. Uh, we'll look at a few. Uh, these are some speaking activities from the Hub uh, series, the new course book series. Um, and here's the first one, if the slide opens, a debate. Okay, so this is one from the, the Hub book. Um, this is from the B1 level. You're going to hold a debate, which is better, box sex and on demand or traditional TV shows. Of course, that's not just uh, a cold talk about this they will have done some reading there will have been a few arguments to give them some ideas etc etc um and that's the speaking task that culminates that's an example of a debate okay here's another one a role play okay choose a problem from the box role play two friends trying to um solve the problem that they have okay here's another example of a speaking task OK. A class survey. And here's a class survey about everyday things that make people happy. Now, I, I, I read something a, a little while ago about a market. I think it was a food company and they did a survey and they wanted people's ideas about the little everyday things in life that make them happy. And they wanted to use that as part of their marketing. And here are some of the ideas. Getting into bed after a long day, finding a bargain in the shops, relaxing with a good book. Uh, I think some other things on the, on the survey from this food company was the cold side of the pillow, which I quite liked. Have we all done that when you turn your pillow over and it's cold on the other side? I um, asked this question in Malta at a workshop a couple of weeks ago, and somebody said their favorite little pleasure is opening a tin of lip balm for the first time and having that first bit of unused lip balm, which I thought was great for a, a nice little everyday pleasure that makes her happy. Yes, that's exactly what I thought. Yes. Anyway, so what about you? Could you just maybe have a little think for a few seconds and then just type in what everyday pleasure makes you happy? For me, it's maybe a glass of wine and listening to my vinyl records. First cup of tea. Yeah, good. A glass of wine, cup of coffee, exercising. OK, good. Playing with your pet, wine and chocolate on the balcony, the dog, a hot shower, Netflix and tea. OK, tea with mint. OK, cake for breakfast. OK, yeah. My baby fall asleep on my belly. Yes. A hot bath, the gym. OK. OK, some nice ideas here. Cup of tea again. OK, walking my dogs. OK, yoga. Fantastic. Warm pajamas on a cold day. OK, turning the aircon in my car. Great. Some nice ideas. So that's a little idea that I think uh, the students might quite find fun. They can choose their own favorite little everyday things that make them happy, then do a little survey and share their ideas. OK, so that's another example of an extended speaking. Let's move on and look at another one. Okay. Decide on the best animal picture. So this is an exercise uh, where it's a decision making, it's a discussion. Uh, and of course, um, you can use the language of opinion would be very would be very frequent in, in this kind of exercise. And again, it's not just asking the learner cold out of nowhere. This comes after a reading text about a, a nature photographer. He then talks about the qualities, the characteristics of a good animal picture. So based on the information we've put in, the students then decide which animal picture they like. They decide on their own and then they have a group discussion and they have to choose a winner of though this was a photographic competition. So I'd be interested to know which of those pictures do you like best? Which of, which of those is your favorite? Maybe you'd just like to write the name of the animal or the Nemo, that's the fish, B, the puffin. B is a puffin, E, B, D, F. Okay, we've got the Nemo again, A, the elephant, 
He, no one, ah, the frog. I was going to say no one's mentioned the frog, but somebody just mentioned the frog. Okay. So again, I mean, I hope you see that that would be an, another example of, a, of an engaging, interesting speaking activity. Okay. I think my favorite is B. I like puffins. Okay. Cute. Yeah. Let's move on. Okay. And one more speaking activity that we'll look at is a presentation. When I asked at the beginning, some of you mentioned presentations. Uh, here's one way of setting up a presentation. Uh, this is from a unit about natural wonders. Uh, it's about the natural world and a, and a feature on natural wonders. Um, and here you have the Gulfos Falls in Iceland. Maybe some of you have visited there. It's an amazing place. Uh, and to set up the presentation, what we do, we listen to somebody giving a presentation about the Gulfos Falls. As you listen, you hear the information here. Where is it located? How was it formed? Or when was it formed? What is it surrounded by? You hear a model and then you choose a natural wonder in your country or maybe on your continent. And then you prepare and you plan a presentation of your own. Um, so that's another example of a kind of extended speaking. So we've, we've looked at a, a few examples, debates, role plays, discussions, giving your opinions, decision making and a presentation. Lake Baikal, I've been to Lake Baikal, yes. Um, that would be a very good one to do this kind of um, uh, activity for. OK, so there are some examples of some kinds of extended speaking activities. OK, but why? do extended speaking okay and again another question that you could maybe just um put a, a quick answer in, in the box why do extended speaking in the classroom okay any ideas why do extended speaking activities? what's the benefit fluency help develop fluency sure fluency fluency confidence exactly if, Agnieszka, if a student can speak at length that can get, really give them some confidence freedom to express themselves gabrielle yep Okay, good. It's learner centered, fantastic. Enhances real communication skills. I mean, a lot of our speaking is extended, isn't it? Okay, great. Prepare for state exams. That's a, 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 a good reason. Okay, improve their critical thinking, sharing ideas in a natural way, ingrates what they've learned, a good way of practicing the language and the content they've learned. OK, fantastic. Some great ideas there. This is a little checklist that I and it's fun, Susanna. Good. And a challenge in itself. OK, have a little look at those. I'll just keep quiet for a few seconds. You have at those. These are some um, suggestions of why I think extended speaking uh, is a good thing to do in the classroom. So I think we mentioned some of these. It personalizes language learning, which I think is a good thing. By personalizing, it doesn't just mean talking about your own experiences. It, it can be mean, you know, mean something like expressing your opinion about something, for example, about the pictures. Uh, so it doesn't have to be something that has happened to you or that you're interested in, but it's where you in, in some way engage with it on a personal level. You express your opinion or your feelings about something. It can be authentic. OK, if you went to somebody somewhere like one of these natural wonders, you probably would talk about it. And, and the person you're speaking to probably would ask you questions about it and so on and so on. OK, there's a focus on meaning. It's meaningful language. You're expressing what you want to express rather than going through the motions of practicing a certain grammatical form. OK, it can be motivating and enhance group dynamics. Good for the class. Yes, while one person is speaking, the other person is listening. It's an interactive two way supportive process. It's real time production. You're not reading a script. You're not reading a dialogue. You're, 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 you're producing the language in real time, which I think is a very useful skill to help our learners develop. And the bottom two things here are where I want to focus now for the next stage of this webinar. Um, it bridges the divide between fluency and accuracy. And how do we achieve that? Well, one way we can achieve that is allowing the learners some planning time. OK, there's a question how. And this is what we're going to look at now. 
So I'd now like to focus on the second main area of, of this webinar, which is the usefulness, the importance of planning time when we ask our students to speak. In other words, very simply, giving our learners a little time to plan what they want to say before they say it. So this is what we're going to investigate now. Okay, we talked about bridging accuracy and fluency and planning time is one way that we can do that. Okay, planning enables us to enhance accuracy and enhance fluency. Okay, so we're going to now look at a, a little bit of sort of a, a background into that. However, first, pre-task planning. Again, just to paraphrase, planning, allowing the learners some time to plan what they want to say before they say it. What are the pros and the cons of that? Okay, would anyone like to um, make a few suggestions of any benefits of planning or any reasons why planning is not such a good idea? Preparedness of vocab, thinking of the vocab, managing time. It's not authentic, a con, we'll talk about that in a minute. It helps with accuracy, it, it can help with structure, help to organize their ideas. A, a con, I presume it's time consuming, not authentic. Okay, it can give the learner more confidence. Okay, it's not spontaneous, which is a con, it's less authentic. Okay, interesting. Some interesting ideas here. It can help you formulate your ideas. It can give you a roadmap, help you plan the structure, I guess you mean. Okay, okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay, so we're going to, some of the ideas you've mentioned, we're going to touch on and explore a little more deeply. So firstly, the anti-planning, if the slide loads, okay, anti-planning. As some of you mentioned, quite a few of you mentioned, it's not a, an authentic task. Uh, there is an argument, there is an argument that allowing the students to plan is not representative of real world situations. Therefore, it's not indicative of the learner's real world proficiency because it's not asking them to speak spontaneously, which people may argue is more of a realistic indication of the proficiency. There is, there has been uh, a frequent argument against having planning time in tests. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the IELTS uh, speaking paper, um, task two, you get some prompts, you have one minute to think about what to say, then you have two minutes to speak. There is an argument um, that that is unrealistic because it doesn't actually indicate the student's actual proficiency. Okay. However, however, anticipating what sort of language is needed in a given situation is similar to what second users will do in real life. That's Martin Bygate. So the other side of the coin is that actually in the real world, we do anticipate and we do plan. I know I have, I'm sure you all have, you know, when you've been speaking a foreign language, you've anticipated, you, you've maybe rehearsed what you need to say. You've maybe anticipated the response and you've maybe anticipated and planned your response to the response. So in a way, this planning is I think a very useful skill that we can get our learners to um, start to employ. Maybe they do it spontaneously, but I think, you know, we, we can encourage them. So there are two sides to this. It's not indicative of real world proficiency, but at the same time, it's something that we do do. Okay, let's look at reasons for planning. Okay, Patrick Howarth. Planned speech can give the speaker the opportunity to experiment with and develop language. And again, when you were putting your ideas in the chat box, uh, you know, a lot of you were saying it helps you to plan. It helps you to find the vocabulary that you need. And the planning time allows you to do that exactly. So you might use some language that perhaps if you were speaking spontaneously, you wouldn't be able to use. Yes, you wouldn't have the time to think about it and to formulate it. OK, so planning is authentic for second language users, Rachel. I think so in certain contexts. Yes. 
as a consequence of the learner being able to think about the language and find the vocabulary and search inside here for the language, it can play a key role in helping interlanguage development. Interlanguage is, is, a, is a, 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 maybe a slightly technical term, basically for your second language um, that you're developing. It's not your language, it's, it's a language that you're developing. Uh, so the actual act of planning helps you to produce maybe slightly better language than if you didn't plan, which in turn helps with your language development. Okay. So, also, learners who plan tasks generally attempt more ambitious and complex language and hesitate less. And there's a lot of research. Foster and Skeyen, Pauline Foster and Peter Skeyen, one of their research areas is pre-task planning in speaking. So, planning before you speak in an English as a foreign language context is a academic field that has been researched for 30 years uh, or 30 or so years. And what over this 30 years, the research has generally consistently shown is that you attempt more ambitious language, you attempt more complex language and you hesitate less. And we'll go a little bit deeper into that. So Pauline Foster, did a whole load of research and she got some people to do a extended speaking task in the English language classroom. She got some of the participants who didn't plan. These are the non-planners. And as we can see here, on average, in five minutes speaking, they paused 25 times and they were silent for 90 seconds. So that's one and a half minutes of the five minutes was silent. This is a distillation, a summary of her research. She then had people who planned the task. So it was, you're going to talk about this. I want you to talk for about five minutes. I'm going to give you time to plan what you want to say. What do you think happened to these figures? I've put two question marks. What do you think? Can you type in the chat box? What do you think was the average number of pauses? and the average silence. 50 second silence, four pauses, fewer. Okay, we can, I think, assume fewer, but would you like to have a go at some actual figures? Three to five pauses, 75 cent, 10 seconds, 10 and 10 from Magdalena, 10 and 30, 12 pauses, 40 second silence, much less, yep, I, yeah, 30 seconds of silence. 10 pauses, 20 seconds. Okay, you're all kind of quite close. Okay, here we go. This is when the, whoops. Ah. Sorry, I just go back a slide. Okay, so that is what happened, okay? So the pausing was roughly halved and the silence was significantly decreased from 90 seconds to 21 seconds. And this that was simply with the learner being allowed to think about what they wanted to say. OK, so you can see the fluency is greatly, greatly improved. OK. Uh, and there's no fancy, complicated technique. It's literally there's no extra material fed in. It's literally allowing the learner to pull out, to find what they've already got um, in, in their interlanguage. And it's just giving them the opportunity to uh, use it in their speaking. OK. I don't agree with these stats at uni level. OK, fine. We can maybe talk about that later. OK, uh, so let's put that into words. Pre-task planning can impact positively on language performance in terms of fluency and complexity. Yes, research after research after research showed you were more fluent, you paused less, there was less silence, there was less hesitation, and you did attempt more complex language. The research also showed you were attempting more complex language, which is a key driver in developing the interlanguage. However, 
Fluency, yes. More complex language attempted, yes, which is great. But were you more accurate? Over this 20, 30 plus years, there have all, there's also been a lot of research to say that if you plan, are you more accurate? Dramatically accurate. And over the 20 or 30 years, the research, the data on this has been inconsistent or inconclusive. For example, Rod Ellis did some research and he showed that your accuracy was increased when you planned. He then repeated the research a few years later and showed there was no significant increase in your accuracy. OK, and all these people have, have, have done this research and they, they've all that if you combine all the results, there's a lot of inconsistency. So one of my main interests is grammar. And I decided to research this. So what we're going to do now is the third section um, of the talk before we put it all together. Uh, and we have a little look at uh, ELT research. And this is my research. I decided to investigate if you plan are you more accurate? And just to repeat, yes, you're more fluent, et cetera, et cetera. You attempt more complex, but are you more accurate if you plan? OK, so let's have a look at the research that I undertook very briefly. I'd like to give you a little summary of it. OK, so I gave uh, 50 participants, 50 participants. Uh, each of them did a task which they planned. And each of them did a task which they didn't plan. Here is an example task. Talk about a film that you like. What type of film is it? What's the main story? And I gave the learner these prompts of something to talk about. Task B was very similar, but instead of talking about a film, they spoke about a piece of music or a song that they liked. And essentially what I did, I tossed a coin. The statisticians at the university, they said the best way to be random is to toss a coin. So A, you do task A first. B, you do task B. For, sorry, heads, you do task A first. Tails, you do task B first. Toss the coin again. A, you plan it. B, you don't plan it. So it was totally random. So a student, may, a participant maybe did task A first with planning or task A first without planning or task B first without planning and so on and so on, okay? Uh, and then whichever one they did with planning, the next day they did the other one without planning and vice versa. And the idea was to assess their accuracy and compare the accuracy when they planned and they didn't plan. I hope that's clear. So let's listen to um, one of my participants. She is talking about the film Shrek. Do we know the film Shrek? Quick yes or no. The cartoon animated film Shrek. Yes, yes. A couple of yeses. Yeah, OK. OK. So what I want to do, I'd like us to listen. OK, listen to the student. She's an Argentinian, Alejandra. Um, she is uh, obviously a Spanish speaker. Uh, and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to listen to her. It's only about one minute long. I'd like you to listen to her. One, what do you think of her performance? Do you think she enjoyed the task? Do you think it's a useful task for the classroom? And importantly, do you hear any grammar errors? OK, so have a listen. Do you think she enjoyed it? Do you think it's a useful task? Uh, what do you think of her performance and do you hear some errors? OK, so we're, we're going to listen to this um, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. OK. A particular like, movie called Shrek is a comedy full of humour. Is it working? It's for people of all ages. If OK. A particular like, movie called Shrek is a comedy full of humour. And it's for people of all ages, even when it's an animated movie, but it's for everyone. It's about an ogre that falls in love with a princess 
but I think that it's a nice film because it teach you about it teach you about friendship and love and not giving up to things even when they seem very difficult. Um, I saw Shrek when I was younger with my family, my dad, my mom, my sister, everyone, and we had a nice time watching it and laughing about it. And it was uh, it has an it had an excellent music and instrumental music uh, for being an animated movie, and I would recommend this film to everyone, even <laughs> to little kids and adults, and for those who are getting on a bit, <laughs> and for to, any, to everybody. So that's it. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to get the presentation back. Hopefully it will reappear. Here we go. Okay, and I'm just going to scroll back down to the side where we were. Just bear with me for one moment. Sorry, I'm trying to sl scroll here, scrolling very slowly. Okay. Uh, I've gone too far. Sorry, it's, it's just a bit slow, nearly there. Sorry, do bear with me. It's just being very sticky at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, good. I've fine. Good. Okay. Sorry about that. My, my scrolling was a bit sticky. It kept going backwards and forwards. So, uh, did she, do you think she enjoyed the task? I heard, I saw a few of you. It sounds positive that she did enjoy it. Uh, I think she did enjoy it. Yes. Uh, there she was. She was in grey, cold, wintry Oxford in January, back home in Argentina. It was the middle of the summer. I think it was a very nice experience for her. It made her connect back with home, with her family. Um, she was laughing at the end, Mohammed. yes. I think she enjoyed that task. So I think as a, as a classroom task, uh, I think it's a great thing to do in the classroom. Yes, it ticks a lot of the boxes we've spoken about. It's real time, it's personal, it's engaging, it's meaningful. Um, and uh, Mohammed, you mentioned she laughed at the end. She said something at the end. She said, it's good for people of all ages, especially those who are getting on a bit. Why do you think she smiled? She smiled to herself and you heard a little laugh when she said, I'm getting on a bit uh, for people who are getting on a bit. That was because we had done that piece of vocabulary in the previous lesson. And she took the opportunity to include it as a good student to include it in her speaking okay and that's a nice example of where we said the evidence shows that you do attempt complexity yes had she been speaking spontaneously she probably maybe wouldn't have had to go at that but because she had the time to plan and think about it she chose to include that in her speaking so that's a nice example of the benefit one benefit of planning okay um what about grammar the key thing here, did we hear any grammar errors? I saw a few of you typing as we were um, listening. Any grammar errors? Okay. There were a few. For example, can you remember any third person verb form? Yes. Not very many. Yes, but they were minor. I agree they were minor. And this, this is another great thing about this. The focus is on uh meaning and content and you said they were minor i would suggest that had she not planned it they would maybe be less minor. there were probably four um, a few more as so this is what we heard it's just loading 
Ah, she self-corrected herself, but did she? Now the page, there we go. So this is what we heard. And just as a aside, uh, in um, technically, when you write down spoken script, you shouldn't use punctuation. Okay, if you're academically analyzing spoken script, we don't use punctuation because when we speak, comma, we don't use pronunciation, punctuation, sorry, full stop. Okay, so this is why there's no punctuation here. Uh, there are the errors she made. Uh, she may be self-corrected in some places, but it teach you about, it teach you about, she didn't self-correct. She tried, she realized she'd made an error. She tried to repair it, but she repeated the error. Okay, uh, even when, even if, an animated, no and for being an animated movie which i think is a spanish interference whereas in english it would be for an animated movie okay so as we've been saying a few little grammar errors but nothing really of importance nothing that interfered with meaning so basically i i would say that's a really nice little bit of speaking that she enjoyed um and a very positive experience for her and there at the bottom is where she said she it's good for those who are getting on a bit which was this nice gave her the possibility to use this to increase the complexity where perhaps she wouldn't if she'd planned so let's get back to the research which is what this is all about in my research i had 50 participants each one spoke with planning and without planning so i had a hundred of these that i had to analyze and I had to analyze the grammar and then I had to compare the grammar with when they planned and when they didn't plan. And it was the same student who planned and didn't plan. It wasn't a different student with different strengths. It was the same student. They were a day apart. So there was no chance for them to have generally improved their English apart from in 24 hours. So I needed to measure the grammar. And the, the measure that I decided was to count the number of clauses count the number of errors so six out of 25 is a inaccuracy of 24 percent it is an accuracy of 76 percent so i did this for a hundred of these scripts gave each one a measure of accuracy and compared the accuracy okay and here is a little example of what we found. This is just 10 of the participants. Remember there were 50 in total. NP, non-planning. PTP, pre-task planning. So the NP column, PTP, pre-task planning. In other words, NP, they didn't plan. PTP, pre-task, they did plan. And then the third column is the increase in accuracy. I've put this here to show you just as the illustration. One of the 50, there was no change. This person had the same accuracy whether they planned, when they planned, didn't plan. One participant was actually more inaccurate when they did plan. But 48 of the 50 were all more accurate when they planned. The statisticians did some statistics and they decided that was very, very significant. It wasn't chance. It wasn't random. It was significant. It passed all their, their tests that they, they did. OK, um, so there's very compelling data there. How could we measure the accuracy? Well, as I said, you know, the number of errors as a ratio to the number of clauses. OK, as we can see, some of the participants had a. 25, 24, 30% accuracy. Here's a question for you. Which level learner, higher level or lower level, do you think had the biggest improvement when they planned? Higher level or lower level? Who improved the most? Who benefited the most from planning? Natalia, low level, lower, higher. Magdalena, lower, higher. Question mark, Marie, yes. Higher. Ah, well, it was actually the lower levels. All the ones that were in the 20s, 25, 24, 30, they were A2 level, possibly B1. 
the ones which were in single figures, 3%, 2%, 9%, they were probably the B2 and the C1 level uh, students. So this is another interesting thing that um, the lower level learners can benefit more from planning, whereas the higher level learners are probably more proficient anyway. So sp in spontaneous speech, they would be quite a high level. Of course, they still do improve, but less significantly. So this is something for us to think about in the classroom. Maybe giving planning time is perhaps more useful for our lower level learners. So let's summarize everything. In my research, when the learners didn't plan, there was an average of 70% accuracy. As I said, measured by the number of clauses, the number of errors. What do you think was the accuracy? 80, 89, 90? Okay, 85, 85. Nobody's got the right number yet, but you're close. You're all, no. Agnieszka's pretty close. And somebody else was as well. And Ina as well. Okay. I'm just moving to the next slide, but it doesn't seem to be moved. Yes, there we go. Oh, no. Sorry, it's gone twice. I do apologize. It's a bit sticky here. It's 81%. Uh, Marina, very close. Okay, 81%. So the research was statistically shown that you are that significantly bit more accurate. Let's put that into practical terms, that if when you speak like Alejandra did for a one or two minutes, if you make two, three or four fewer errors, that can only be a good thing, a good thing for the learner, a good thing for their confidence and a good thing for helping them to develop their interlanguage and develop uh, their language in general. OK, so that's hopefully uh, interesting for some of you, a little insight into a bit of ELT research. But the important thing is something as simple as allowing our students a little bit of time to plan what they want to say can improve their fluency, improve, improve the complexity they attempt, and according to my research, improve their accuracy. It shows that they've already got the language in here. We're not inputting language of some use, it's in here. And it, it, makes us realize how many times do we ask the students to do something and we don't really give them enough time to fulfill their true potential. Okay, so let's just sort of move towards the end now and wrap things up. Um, we think what's happening is based in Lavelle's three stages of speaking. Some of you may be familiar with this, three stages of speech processing. The first stage is the conceptualization stage. Content is encoded into propositions. We talk about propositional content. In other words, what do I want to talk about? So when we're speaking, the first thing we do is we think about what do I want to say? Then once we've established the propositional content, what I want to say, we then very quickly, almost simultaneously, linguistically code it. So we turn what we want to say in how to say it. And that's the appliance of grammar. I think that's where the grammar, that's what grammar is, isn't it? Turning our ideas into uh, language. And then the third stage of Lavelle's um, three stages is articulation, where we actually speak it. Now, when we plan a speaking task, what we're doing, the planning enables us to do stage one. We've already decided what we want to say. Also, maybe we've done some linguistic coding. Maybe we've thought about how to say it. For example, if we go back to Alejandra, she'd maybe already decided to put to use this uh, for those getting on a bit, this nice little idiom. OK, so we we establish the content, what we start to think about why, so that when we actually speak, our brain can attend to can, to, can focus on how to say it rather than spending time thinking of what to say. And our brain can only attend to so much. And if our brain is thinking of what to say, 
we can't then linguistically code it as effectively. It's all quite very simple and straightforward. Okay, and as we've shown that the planning improves fluency, accuracy and complexity. So just to wind things up, to wrap things up in the, over the next few minutes, uh, a couple of quotes that you can read that hopefully uh, summarize what I've been saying. Planning time allows students to devote attention to both form and content rather than forcing them to choose one at the expense of the other. If you said talk about this, go, certain individuals will be focused on accuracy. I would like to talk about a film which may be accurate, but at the expense of dynamics and dynamism and colour and content. Other individuals, blah, 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 maybe a lot of content, a lot of emotion, but possibly at the expense of accuracy. Whereas a simple planning stage can allow you to focus, to devote attention to both. Scott Thornbury, talking about something with which you are familiar will be easier for accuracy than something that you create from scratch. And that planning stage builds up that familiarity. So when you speak, you've already thought about what you want to say. Therefore, it's easy for accuracy because you've got the content there, our brain can attend to how to say it. Okay, so, um, did he, did he, the slides are opening. The next slide is opening, I hope. Okay, so what are the implications? Well, I think we can inform our learners about the usefulness of planning for when they're in the classroom and for when they're outside the classroom. Think about what and how. I think a lot of good learners do that anyway, as I mentioned earlier, but I think we can just, you know, encourage our learners to get into the habit of thinking about what and how, just for a few seconds, depending on what the task is, or for a few minutes if it's a longer task, task okay? We can also, allow more planning time across the board. And by across the board, I mean in all aspects of speaking. It doesn't have to be when it's a presentation or when it's a monologue or whatever. I think any time you ask the students to speak in the class, perhaps if we allow them just a little bit of time to think about what they want to say, that can only be a good thing. we can write our own activities. If we are writing our own activities in the classroom, if we design our activities, please try and build in a little bit of planning time. And material design. We, as material writers, course book writers, uh, I think perhaps we can maybe add a bit more planning time. We build them into the exercises a little more than we do. And here is an example. This is a speaking activity from the Hub series. This is actually someone talking about a film and they are actually talking about Shrek. And this is an activity that I wrote and I based it on Alejandra. So it's realistic, it's authentic, it's real language, it's real content. So you listen to her and then you design your, oh, you, you, you formulate your own um, presentation but what we've done based on the theory we've been talking about we have written in a planning stage the teacher's book will also talk about the importance and the usefulness of the planning stage okay so i think just having this overt stage where you plan if you can write it into the materials that can only be a good thing okay i've kind of got to the end of this webinar uh so i'm just going to say Thank you. Uh, I hope that was interesting for you. Uh, you will get a, a, a copy, a recording, I believe. Um, the book, if you contact me, Villain, it's, it's a, a new course book series, the Hub series, QB, okay, available um, internationally, globally. Uh, and what we've looked at is a few, few examples of activities from it. If you are interested, I'm just going to show you one slide very quickly.
if you are interested, uh, if, if it will open, it doesn't seem to open, but I've got a, I've got a reference of some selected um, research uh, references on the subject of planning when you're speaking. As I said, it is a well-researched area of issues of foreign language. Ah, here it appears. Okay, so you can get a copy of this as well if that's anything of interest to you. You don't need to read all that now, but these are some of the, I think, are some of the key key papers. As I said, planning is an area of research. We might not think of it as, but but it is. Okay, so uh, I think we have a couple of minutes. If anyone has any questions, I've tried to address your questions as we're going along. I apologise if I've missed your question, but if anyone has a burning question. Um, how can you sound fluent? Ah, but they're moving a bit too quickly. Hi, John. In the meantime, I just want to really, really thank you. With... Sorry, I missed that question. It was quite a long question. Okay. Hi, um, John. Hi. Sorry, I tried to grab your question, but uh, it just disappeared a bit too quickly. So whose question was it? Um, can no you... sound. I'm sorry. Was that Henry? I had no sound. Can you hear me oh, now? Here we go. How can you reconcile fluent concerns with real-time responsiveness? Planned activities detract from real-time responsiveness. Well, yes, as we said, you know, I think answering that question, you know, I think you're saying that planning time isn't a, a realistic, it detracts from spontane spontaneity. Of course, there's a time for spontaneity in the classroom. Uh, and at times, I think it's good to have activities that are, do rely on spontaneity. However, as we've said, there's a lot of very compelling evidence that planning improves your performance, which could only be a good thing in terms of your language development. So I think, yes, do have spontaneous speaking activities, of course, but at the same time, I think do have ones maybe a little more than we tend to where learners plan because of the benefits from that. Okay, anything else before we all go for our tea, supper, breakfast, lunch? glass of wine whatever how long for planning well that depends on the activity that's that's a, a teacher management thing isn't it i guess ever however much uh, time you, you have in the classroom okay so thank you everybody uh in a word i hope that was useful interesting please do get in touch with me with any comments uh come and like my facebook page and it'd be nice to hear from you at some point in the future hi Tom. okay thank you very much Hi, I just um, take the chance to thank you all. Thank you, attendees and John so much on behalf of the entire team here at Macmillan. Thank you, John. It was an amazing session.